whatever we mean by evil, we can all agree that it's evidence that there's just something wrong with the world. And when we say wrong, we don't mean just, I don't, I just don't like it. We don't mean, I, I would prefer it to be a different way. No, we mean really wrong, really broken in this world. Hey guys, I'm Bill Westers, and this is the Encountering Truth Podcast. Welcome to the Encountering Truth Podcast, where we examine the evidence for Christianity, engage culture with kindness and conviction, and encounter Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. If God exists, and if God is good, then why is there so much evil in the world? In our last episode, we had Pastor Mark Sowersby come on and tell us a story about the horrible abuse and trauma that he experienced as a child. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back and, and you should really go back and check that out. But it's a powerful story of forgiveness and transformation about how after seven years of childhood abuse uh, and of every unimaginable kind, he came to know Christ which set him on a journey of forgiveness towards uh, his abuser and, and others. But you can hear more of Pastor Mark's story by listening to the episode, or you can get his book, Forgiving the Nightmare. But one of the things that came up in our conversation with Pastor Mark Sowersby in that episode was that there were times when he was going through that abuse where he would cry out to God, say, God, why? If you're real, then how come? And if you're loving, then why? Why would God allow something like this to happen? This is a question that many of us would ask and have asked many times. If God is real, how could he let something evil like this happen to a child. Maybe you've experienced something horrible like Pastor Mark did. Maybe you too wonder why a good God would allow something like that to happen. Well, one thing that we can all agree on is that what happened to Pastor Mark Sowersby as a child and what may have happened to you or someone that you know is just downright evil. In fact, many people have actually walked away from the faith or, or declared that they could never believe in a God that would allow the existence of evil like this in the world. And they say that if God is good and loving, then he would not allow or he, he would not want evil in the world. And if God is all powerful, then he could just get rid of it, right? Get rid of all the evil in the world. Well, yet evil exists. In the world and therefore if God exists at all then he is either not all good and loving or he is not all powerful or both well it seems that if he is good that then he must lack the power to eradicate evil or else he would do so right or, or on the other hand, if, if he's all powerful, but he does not use his power to defeat and eliminate the evil that exists in the world, then he must not be all good. He would be at best apathetic and, and at worst evil to the core and, and diabolically sadistic, finding pleasure in the suffering of the very human beings that he himself created in his own image. So it's no wonder that many people claim the existence of evil in the world as their primary reason for not believing in a God who would allow such evil. Well, uh, how do we reconcile then a God depicted in Christianity with the obvious existence of evil in the world? This is called the problem of evil, and it is about as old as philosophy itself. It's believed to have been originated by the Greek philosopher Epicurus, but it was later popularized by the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume. 
It's a common question among skeptics, and it's and it's a legitimate question. This is not something that should just be brushed off and, or swept under the rug by Christians, declaring that, well, oh, you just need to have more faith or some other lackluster disregard, right? On the other hand, Christians, we don't have to shy away in fear of, of this or, or any other difficult topic like this. See, Christianity has a response. And in fact, it is the only worldview that can legitimately answer this question. Not only that, but the Christian worldview even offers hope in the midst of this despair. You see, this is not just a problem for Christians. It's a human problem. If someone walks away from Christianity and takes out God out of the picture, that doesn't just eliminate the problem of evil. Evil still remains and questions still abound that have to be answered. So before diving in uh, into laying out uh, an, uh, an insensitive just response to this question or addressing the problem by itself, you first have to pause and address the person. You have to ask, look, if someone is bringing up this objection of why is there so much evil in the world, I cannot believe in a God that, that would allow so much evil in this world, you have to slow down and pause and say, why are they asking this question? Or, or bringing up this objection to God. Well, chances are that they've gone through something themselves that's been very, very difficult for them, that they, maybe they've even experienced something evil or, or traumatic firsthand. So we need to, to figure out where this is coming from and, and treat them with compassion and understanding and, and help them walk through it. After where we meet them personally, uh, meet them where they are personally, then we can go on to talk about why a good and powerful God would allow evil in the world. Well, this attempt to resolve this question of how evil exists if God is all good and all powerful is this. This attempt. This is what you would call a theodicy. The attempt to resolve a question of how evil exists and with a God that is all good and all powerful. So, first of all, there is a short answer to this question that that Greg Kokel lays out in his book, Street Smarts. He says, it's certainly conceivable that a good, powerful God might allow evil if he had good reason to do so. This mere possibility is enough to nullify the contradiction, which is why it's so rare for philosophically astute atheists to raise this question anymore. End quote. So remember that God is not just all good and all powerful, but he's also all knowing. And he might have a good reason, and albeit inconceivable to us, we might not be able to understand what his reasoning is, but he might as an all-knowing, omniscient God, have good reason for allowing this evil. So that's the short answer. But it can be a little bit unsatisfying, right? It's definitely worth teasing out certain aspects of of that a little bit. So, first of all, in order to kind of examine this a little bit more, we first have to address the issue, uh, uh, we first have to address the idea of what do we mean by evil? Okay, well, in doing that, we, of course, we, we, most of us would probably immediately jump to the idea of things like murder, rape, abuse, war, genocide, and things like that. Or maybe maybe you might think of some accidental events or resulting in injury or death, someone that may have gotten in a car crash or uh, some sort of accidental death by caused by someone else or or perhaps you we would think of something maybe less about physical actions and more about conditions or occurrences like sickness and disease or cancer birth defects or untimely death 
Or maybe you would go even farther and say, well, what comes to mind to you would be something related to natural disasters or, or what someone might actually call an act of God, like the destruction due to tornadoes or fire or famine or something like that. Well, however, it, whatever comes to mind when we talk about evil, whatever we mean by evil, we can all agree that it's evidence that there's just something wrong with the world. And when we say wrong, we don't mean just, I, don't, I just don't like it. We don't mean, I, I would prefer it to be a different way. No, we mean really wrong, really broken in this world. We are meaning that it's not just a matter of personal preference, but that they are actually wrong regardless of what anyone or any uh anyone else says or thinks. But if we can identify that there's actually something really wrong with the world, then there must be a way that things are actually supposed to be the right way. As Greg Kokel puts it in his book, he says, it makes no sense to say that things are not the way they're supposed to be unless there is a way they're supposed to be, and there can't be a way they're supposed to be without a sposer. <laughs> and it's, it's like what C.S. Lewis talks about in, in Mere Christianity. He says, my argument against God was that this universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? And then he later, C.S. Lewis, goes on to say, of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own, but if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my fancies. And then he goes on to say, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning, just as if there were no light in the universe, and therefore no creatures with eyes. We should never have known that it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. So the entire problem of evil then rests on the idea that there is such a thing as objective right and wrong, objective good and evil. Without an objective standard of good, well, there can be no evil, as there would be nothing by which you could even measure what evil is. And if there's no evil, well, then there's no problem of evil, right? But in fact, God's very nature is that perfect moral standard of good. But if God does not exist, then the problem of evil just disappears. It's as if uh, what atheist Richard Dawkins puts it this way. He says, quote, If the universe were just electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky. And you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe, has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no good, and no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, end quote. So in other words, if Dawkins is correct, evil is simply an illusion. Now, going back to Greg Kokel's book, Street Smarts, he says, in the final analysis, In a world without God, deep morality, objective morality, turns out to be an illusion. Whatever is, is right. Nothing more can be said. The atheist's own answer then to the problem of evil, that is the only answer that's left to him, is that there is no problem of evil. Here is the irony. The existence of evil initially fueled the atheist's fury toward God, yet his own worldview turns the wickedness he was so intense about into complete illusion. So, is evil just an illusion then? Can a person just dance to their DNA 
as Dawkins puts it, without having to be held to an account? No. Deep down inside, we know that there are certain things that are just truly evil. Rape, murder, genocide, racism, abuse, like what happened to Pastor Mark Soresby and maybe some of you. They are evil. We know this deep down inside. But how can we know that those things are evil rather than things like kindness, generosity, and sacrificial love? Because there is a moral law written on our hearts, given to us by a moral law giver. So we know that evil is real. It's not an illusion. We all know that it's real. We've all experienced it to some degree at some point in our lives. And if evil is real, then there must be an objective standard of good, a straight line, to, so to speak, like C.S. Lewis would put it, by which we can call it evil. And the only thing that even makes sense to serve as that transcendent objective standard of good is the very nature of God himself. So if evil is real, and of course it is, as we all know, then God exists and God is good. But that brings up the next question. If God exists and is good, yet evil remains, does that mean that God is not all-powerful? Can he not just eliminate the evil in the world? Well, first, remember the short answer that we said earlier on, that it is conceivable or possible that a good and powerful God might allow evil if he had good reason to do so. So we can speculate about what that good reason could be, but since our minds are finite rather than omniscient, like God's, who knows all, and since God cannot, and since God has not clearly explained it to us in His Scriptures, well, of course, then our speculation is merely that. It's just speculation. But we can base that on logic and reason, okay? and it can lead us to what we could consider the best possible explanation for the way things are. So, the first question we have to ask then is, if God were to eliminate evil in the world, who's to say that he wouldn't start with you? We all do evil. We all violate the perfect moral standard that is God's very nature. Well, you say, well, it's, I don't do really bad things. Well, well what, what, what would make something bad enough, evil enough, to have to be eliminated? What can we measure that by? But here's the thing. Small sin, big sin, that's not really actually the issue. See, the issue is not the size of the sin or the, the how bad bad the evil is, the issue is actually the source of the evil. Okay, That's the issue. The source of the evil is our free will. As Frank Turek and Norm Geisler po pointed out in their book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, he said, if God were to do away with evil, then he would have to do away with free choice. And if he did away with free, our free choice, we would no longer have the ability to love or do good. This would no longer be a moral world. So, what would be better or more loving to create a world where we could choose to love and do good or where we were forced to love and do good. 
As Turek and Geisler say, God can't force free creatures not to sin. Forced freedom is a contradiction. Perhaps this may just be the best way to get to the best possible world. So we know that not all things are good. But Romans 8.28 tells us that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But what about natural disasters, disease, premature death? We can obviously recognize the fact that not all evil actually comes from free will. Well, of course, it's because it's the result of the fall of man. Romans 8, 18 to 22, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So, it's the fall of man is also something that contributes to the evil in this world, particularly the evil that is not the result of free will or free choice. So, another thing to consider is that we can't always explain these things, but we know that there are We can't always explain why someone might go through some of these evil things in this world. But we know that there are certain virtues that the Lord wants to develop in us that he can't develop in us until we go through certain trials. For instance, you cannot develop patience without having to wait. You can't develop courage without some sort of danger that you have to face, something to be afraid of and have courage in the face of. You can't develop perseverance without having something to push through and continue on in. You can't develop compassion without seeing someone in need. And then J. Warner Wallace uh, if you listen to him talk, sometimes he'll, he'll often suggest that maybe we have actually the wrong view of life. You see, we often look at life as a, a line segment where it begins at one point and ends at another point. However, if Christianity is true, people don't die. They just change locations. So J. Warner Wallace says it, that maybe we should actually look at life more like a ray. Now, which, if you remember from geometry class, it starts at one point, which is like birth, right? Starts at one point, passes through another point, death, but then continues on for infinity. Or I should say eternity. And if you think about it, the longer that continues on, the shorter that segment seems to appear. Think about it. If you suffer for an entire 24-hour period of the day, that's the whole day. But if you put that into a week, well, that's only one-seventh of the week. Into a month, that's one-thirtieth of a month. If it's a year, it's one in 365 days, right? So it seems smaller and smaller, but then if it goes on for eternity, that short segment seems just like a blip, and then it's gone. One thing we have to remember in the midst of all of this is that God never promised us an easy life. 
He says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He didn't promise us an easy life, but he did promise that he would be with us. In Matthew 28, 20, he says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then again in John 14, 16, and 17, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor or comforter to be with you. He is the Spirit of truth. This is what uh, in the Greek is the divine paraclete, the one who comes alongside, comforter, the counselor, the advocate. So as free creatures, look, none of us would ever choose to suffer and to have to go through this evil. But look, one man did. And I love how Frank Turek and Norm Geisler put it. It has been the only real case of a bad thing happening to a truly good person. So we can complain to God about pain and suffering, but we have to admit that he did not exempt himself from it. So, Jesus was the only true good person. So when we ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, bottom line, none of us are truly good. But Jesus was sinless, perfect. Yet Jesus, being God himself, God chose to endure suffering. He ex Jesus, as he walked this earth, he experienced pain. He experienced loss and abandonment, betrayal, cruelty, hunger, weariness, even natural disasters, and ultimately death. So the irony here is that in the midst of the evil and the suffering in this world, rather than despair, we can actually find hope and comfort. Because we know that if evil exists, and it does, then God must exist, and He is the ultimate standard of good. And not only that, but He is also no stranger to our pain. He has endured it all himself. And although he might not keep us from the evil, he will always be with us through the evil. As our divine paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the advocate, the counselor, our comforter. And at the end of the day, we know how the story ends. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the Former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So thank you guys 
so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure you take some time to subscribe to the podcast. And if you have a chance, leave us a good review and rating because that would really help get the word out and, and help reach more people that need that that confidence in who they are in Christ, that security in knowing that this, that Christianity is true. So share it on social media and with your friends. Follow the Facebook page and visit the website, EncounteringTruth.org. And feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, anything that you want to talk about. We'd love to hear from you. So remember, let's make it our goal to examine the evidence, engage culture, and encounter Jesus. God bless. We'll see you next time.